And we're back on Body Signals, and I am thrilled to have Dr. William Dixon back on the show. Doc, welcome back to Body Signals. Howdy. It's good to see you. I've got a question for you. Did you watch this uh, this year's Oscars? I actually did not. Did I miss anything? I didn't either. <laughs> I actually didn't either. But I, I love the opening monologues, so I actually watched, uh, I recorded it and just watched the opening monologue. And I don't know if you heard about this, but Jimmy Kimmel opened the show and one of his first jokes is he was looking around the room and he says, when I look around this room, I help, I can't help but wonder, is Ozempic right for me? <laughs> it's fun. I mean, it got a, got a huge response from the audience, but it got me know thinking, you know, it, yeah, it got me thinking you can't pick up a copy of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times or, or any of the main stream newspapers or magazines and not see an article about uh, GLP ones. So I thought this is a great time for us to do a, an episode specifically about this topic. Yeah, for sure. They're yeah, uh, definitely I, I'd in love... the cultural zeitgeist right now. Uh, and I think for good reason. Absolutely. So maybe just to start, I, I some of our audience may not be familiar with uh, GLP one. So what is that? What is GLP one? What does it stand for? So GLP one stands for glucagon like peptide one. It's a hormone uh, made by your intestines mostly in response to food that you eat. Um, it's an increasing, which is a group of hormones, but uh, it's under that category. And what it means is that uh, it helps you secrete more insulin in response to glucose and food that you eat. Uh, but it seems like the GLP-1s um, have actions all over your body, um, not just your intestines. So that includes liver, muscle, fat tissue, and uh, looks like even in the brain, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, in terms of that, I've I've heard that in, in the brain there are some signals that deal with satiety mm -hmm. um, that might be released that um, that might pe make people you know not feel as hungry or curb their appetite. So there's there's that interaction, right? And then you mentioned with um, with the pancreas, there's uh, upregulation of of insulin. Correct. Well, and isn't there, in, in response oh, to food. So it's not that you're producing in more insulin all the time. So okay. people will say like, oh, well, if it increases how much insulin you make, how does it help you lose weight? But it's not like you're always have high level insulin. So that's the exact question I had for you is that, you know, with, with, when I, I hear insulin upregulation, I'm thinking, well, if there's more insulin circulating, that's going to cause more, um, more sugar, more glucose to be shuttled into adipose tissue. So it seemed like that would make you gain weight versus lose weight. But it's it's in response to food. So that's right. where the difference right. is. Right. And it also makes the insulin that you make naturally work better to some degree. So it's it's a combination of things. So, you know, it again, insulin is not the only thing that directs weight gain or weight loss, but it, as you're trying to lose weight, it's one of the things that we that we can kind of focus on as a as a mechanism to help people lose weight. Okay, got it. And then in addition to those two things, uh, there is some interaction with the GI system where these GLP-1s can um, slow down motility, right? Is that correct? Yeah, and that's, again, because it's a hormone made in response to eating. So you want to digest the things that you've got there and you want to feel full. So it slows down stomach emptying and it increases your ability to digest things. Yeah, so that... We'll get into side effects, but you know the major side effect tends to be nausea, vomiting, constipation—things that you would expect from slowing down your GI tract. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And these drugs—they—they they initially were developed for type two diabetics, correct? Yeah. So the major mechanism or major outcome is is glycemic control or decreasing your glucose again, generally in response to food. Um, so they were developed with the goal of treating type 2 diabetes. Okay. And then somewhere down the down the line, they realized that this is really helping that population with weight loss as well, as well as controlling their glucose, which makes sense. I mean, that's what we're all about is trying to help people um, lose weight, uh, 
get into shape by glucose control. So they're, they're, they seem to be on the same path that we are, which is if you control glucose, then that can help with weight loss. Yeah, and it's this idea of, you know, going beyond calories in, calories out. The way that you, uh, the way that you eat food, interact with food, uh, is it both causes hormonal changes and is a result of hormonal changes. So, I mean, we were just talking about this in the in our in our group channel on uh, the papers we share. If you have someone and they eat uh, a milkshake every day, um, their brain changes over time about how it responds to different kinds of food. Um, and that's not necessarily because they gain weight in this study, but it was because they're just getting, their brain is learning to crave this input. And so if you change the inputs, um, then you can change the outputs. The GLP, that should be GLP one agonists are, is kind of helping your body, uh, change the neural hormonal inputs. Okay. Got it. So if you take one of these drugs, these are, are they, they're injectables, right? Are they just like a subcutaneous injection, like a little needle that you put under your skin? How Correct. Take- Similar to like a small insulin needle. Um, there's actually a few ways of taking them. Um, there are some older generation ones um, that are actually one or twice daily um, injectables. Um, the most common ones that you are hearing about now, um, the semaglutides are once a week, um, as well as terzepatide, which is the kind of newest one on the block, uh, are once a week injectables. And then in the future, there might be uh, once a month injectables. There's one in development right now, um, which has maybe not quite as robust weight loss effect, but you know, once a month versus once daily or once a week is potentially something that people would want. Yeah. And then the I, last one is there's actually an oral version of semaglutide, which is a, a pill you take. I, I didn't know that existed. Mm-hmm. Wow. It, it, is that any less effective than the ones that are administered subcutaneously? It, it does seem to be less effective, especially for weight loss. Um, their, uh, their website has a weight loss of five pounds over six months and a decrease in A1C of 1.2 to 1.4%, depending on the dose, um, which, you know, everything helps for sure. You know, I, I live in Los Angeles, and it's interesting, just at the gym, I overhear conversations about these GLP-1 drugs, mm-hmm. and it um, uh, seems like a lot of people are interested that in, the, in taking one of these, uh, these new medications, not so much for a medical reason, but just for aesthetics. Like the common conversation I hear is, I just would love to lose this last 10 or 15 pounds, so I'm going to go to my doctor and get a prescription for one of these. So I'm curious, as as an MD, your view of using one of these drugs for aesthetics versus using it for type 2 um, diabetes or using it for medically necessary weight loss. Yeah. Um, so I will say, I mean, that's could be a tricky question to, question to answer. And I'm not these people's treating physician, so... Um, but I will say in, in general, I, I don't think of healthcare as like a zero sum game, like one person getting healthier does not mean that another person gets sicker, right? If one person gets healthier, ideally that actually helps everyone get healthier because they have less healthcare costs, you know, insurance, and maybe more likely to cover other things for other people. Um, so I think it's generally, it's a positive thing, uh, for the system if one person gets healthier, if that makes sense. Um. And then right now there's a lot of options to treat diabetes or a lot in a lot of ways to work on healthy weight loss. So I won't necessarily say no one should do anything. Uh, that being said, right now there are shortages of these medications um, for their intended use, which is to treat diabetes or to treat medically relevant obesity. And so uh, I would caution people who are hoping to use this for aesthetic reasons that in this case, you might actually be taking it out of the hands of someone who truly needs it for medical reasons. Um, and thus, uh, you know, maybe you can think about other ways of, of, uh, losing those last five or 10 pounds, or frankly, some people don't need to lose the last five or 10 pounds. The, the last five or 10 pounds kind of quote unquote is often the most difficult to to lose requires the most stringent kind of behavioral changes and uh, is frankly not necessarily 
um, the healthiest thing to do. So I will say, um, <laughs> for now, I definitely advise against that. Um, but I will say in general, uh, I am in favor of using these medications for treatment of obesity. Um, because, uh, as we know, the, the association between, uh, obesity, um, and especially that metabolically active kind of adiposity or fat that we talk about and type two diabetes is like very, very close. And so the goal for type two diabetes management uh, in some recent guidelines and some kind of pieces in, in the literature is actually obesity management, uh, as the outcome and not just glucose control, which is pretty interesting. And so I think that these are super powerful tools for kind of prevention of diabetes in the long term. Now, these drugs are, are meant to be taken long term, right? It's, it's, um, it's not something that you just want to take till you lose the weight that you want to lose. It's, it's more a, you take this drug and then maybe there's a maintenance phase afterwards. Yeah, so the trials that got them approved were all around 58 weeks, and they had really uh, impressive weight loss results, kind of in the order of 15 to 20% weight loss. And that was published in, uh, I think, a big journal. <laughs> and then <laughs> there are some other studies that looked what happens to these people uh, a year after they take the medication, and a lot of them gain most of the way back. So the average was kind of two thirds weight gain, uh, back. Um, that still means they lost, you know, five, 10%, whatever, which is a, a positive outcome, especially when you look at the amount of weight you need to lose in order to have a positive clinical effect on your, uh, numbers, uh, like your, to be cardioprotective or to decrease chance of diabetes, et cetera. It's still definitely in that range. Um, but to, to maintain that, like, impressive or super impressive weight loss, um, generally the recommendation is now that they should be taken for a lifetime. Um, so I, that, that definitely, I think is frustrating for a lot of people. Um, and for some people who aren't necessarily in favor of these medications, it kind of becomes like a, a, a talking point as to why we can't all take these forever. Um, which I also agree we shouldn't all with taking these forever. Um, but it really is, uh, just a reminder that you know, healthy weight in the environment in which we live in right now is, is very difficult. Well, healthy weight maintenance. And, um, it's not, it's like the, the true, or I guess the final outcome for weight maintenance needs to have some other aspects of it, including physical activities and some more appropriate diet. Uh, yeah. But I think so, it can be on a case by case basis, right? Like, same, you know, same with anything, same with Zygnos even. If you, if you do it for six months and then you take a break for two months and, and then you realize that you're starting to, you know, put on weight again, you don't want to, and you can do it again for another three months. Like it can be something that you work with your team or your doctor or whoever to kind of titrate to what you need to be uh, in a healthy spot for you. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a really good point. Um, something we should put a pin in and discuss in, in a bit. Before we get there, if someone's considering taking these drugs, there are a few side effects. So uh, you mentioned a few earlier, but just let's go through the side effects to taking a GLP-1. Yeah, so the most common side effects are nausea and vomiting, which again, it, it works to make you feel full, slow down your gastrointestinal tract, slow down stomach emptying. Um, and so you can imagine that if you're eating the same amount of stuff that you used to eat prior to being on these medications and it's all staying in your stomach for much longer and you never necessarily caught up, um, then you might have those issues. Uh, generally those can kind of be, those go away relatively quickly as, as you start to take uh, more injections, your body becomes a little more, uh, sensitized to the medication. Um, and you can prevent those to some degree by slowly increasing the dose over time. Um, some other side effects in that realm our constipation, abdominal pain, diarrhea, things like that. Um, there is a specific warning and kind of a contraindication for people who have a personal or family history of a thyroid cancer or a specific genetic risk for it. Um, there is a definitely an association between taking GLP-1s and uh, gallstone disease, like uh, cholelithiasis or needing a gallstone surgery, a gallbladder surgery, essentially. 
um, or pancreatitis. And then kind of in an interesting way, it may have some antidepressant effect actually, um, but they're the warning to watch out for behavioral changes or suicidal thoughts and people who start on these. Um, and then one of the things that's not necessarily listed as a side effect, but something that we've seen kind of pop up in anecdotal uh, reports of people describing their experiences is there can actually be um, decreased cravings for like alcohol or other substances. Uh, so I don't know if this is necessarily a side effect as much as maybe a benefit, um, but there's now some trials I think that are ongoing looking for kind of how would you use this as a treatment in alcohol use disorder. Um, and then there is, uh, you know, it's, on the lifespan of all medications, it's still relatively new and still definitely new in terms of uh, finding out long-term like post-market surveillance. So there, you know, any medication that's approved, they're going to continue to watch it to see if side effects start to pop up. There's a famous medication from the uh, 90s, I think, that kind of got pulled off the market after initially being improved for obesity because there was causing heart problems. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you you not that it's causing that it actually looks like it has a cardioprojective effect um but you just never know what will happen long term with now that it's kind of to mass market yeah a point well taken that as as this drug is used longer and longer there might be other things that pop up i i found it interesting that you mentioned the emotional aspect i've actually heard this anecdotally from more than uh, one person that once they started taking the drug and their uh, cravings for food decreased, they kind of discovered how much they love food. And they actually had this, um, they described it as an emotional empty feeling, not having the cravings anymore. That, you know, if your life revolved around going out to dinner with friends and having these great fancy meals, suddenly you're not hungry for them anymore. And uh, one of these individuals actually sought out some uh, some treatment by going to uh, a mental health professional to, to talk about these issues. So it, it might be for some individuals that you need some, some other care besides just the drug. If you're feeling uh, depressed, if you are feeling empty, then, then you definitely should get some help from a mental health professional. That's actually super fascinating. Um, I, you know, I'll, any, the your mind and your mental health and your body and your physical health are so kind of completely intertwined um, in both you know a lot of people who um, have diabetes for example uh, the rates of depression are higher um, the the treatment of one without the other seems you know like a little bit um, like uh, you're just not taking the whole person into account so it's interesting in the in the other way like you know, getting, getting healthier from a physical standpoint, you know, likely if they're on this medication can have some unintended mental health side effects. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah, abs absolutely. So one of the things I, I wanted to talk about was um, this New York Times article that came out that mentioned Ozempic face. And this was making the rounds. Once that, that Times article hit, Everyone was picking this up and talking about Ozempic face. Maybe you could just describe uh, for our listeners what that is. Yeah. So as you gain fat, you store fat everywhere in your body. Um, there's obviously some certain places where people prefer not to have it, generally around their abdomen. But for example, some people tend to store fat in their legs much more than in their abdomen. Um, and that's a genetic thing. Some people tend to store it much more around their uh, organs, which is obviously the most harmful place to have it. And that's a genetic thing. So that's, that explains to some degree how people at different BMI levels or different levels of overall body fat and list can have different metabolic effects, right? So there's, you know, people who are, uh, who have uh, overweight or obesity who have no metabolic effects. Um, and there's people who are barely overweight or obese who have, you know, uh, poorly controlled diabetes, for example. One of the places you have fat is in your face. <laughs> and so if you lose fat very quickly, um, one of the places that you lose it from is in your face. And so it's not necessarily that you're losing fat only from your face. It's that it, it compared to how you looked, it's just more noticeable to some degree that you've now lost 
a lot of weight and some of the weight that you've lost is in your face. And that can change the shape of someone's face, especially if they have been used to how it looks over time. Or if um, they're losing that last, you know, 10 or 15 pounds or whatever it is aesthetically, um, you know, it might be that you are losing it from your face finally when you've not, you're not used to losing that weight there. Um, and so it's kind of a good reminder that there is no, nothing that happens in life or medicine that does not have some kind of uh, unanticipated effects. Um, calling it ozempic face, I think, is uh, <laughs> kind of unfortunate, but but people, right. shouldn't it be like rapid weight loss phase? Yeah, or... I mean, like, like the the way that people are achieving rapid weight loss these days is with some of the diet. So, um, I yeah. think I think the people, everyone has to have a, a take on things. Um, I think these medications overall are going to be extraordinarily useful for people with metabolic disease, um, and. Uh, and their associated risk factors. So, you know, I, these aren't going anywhere, I don't think, again, unless we find some um, some long-term health issues. Um, so, it, it, you know, it is what it is. But I think this is just a good reason why, you you know, you should not just be taking these willy-nilly, but really have a, a, a really have some consideration about how to use them. You know, one of the things I saw, I was looking through the trials, and uh, this hasn't been widely reported, but I was looking at one trial, and 170 of the participants, they actually did DEXA scans on. And then they looked at lean uh, weight loss versus weight loss from fat, and they found that about 39% of the weight loss was attributed to loss in lean mass. Uh, this is kind of interesting. I, I have a hypothesis about this, but have you heard about... Um, the fact that some of the individuals taking these GLP ones might be losing both muscle and fat. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and, and then the study that you cite kind of proves it, right? Any weight loss, to some degree, you will have some lean mass weight loss, um, which is the kind of non-fat body composition, so muscles, bones, etc. That's the weight that you want to have. Um, but this seems to be a very high amount of lean mass weight loss. And some of that is, I think it's a multifactorial, many reasons contributing to that. One is just the pure speed of it um, will, will cause that. Um, the way to prevent that, if you're losing weight, is uh, basically resistance or strength training and high protein diets. So if you're on a medication that suppresses your appetite, but you don't actually change the composition of the food that you're eating. So you still are this kind of standard American, high fat, high sugar, high carb, very delicious uh, diet that doesn't have that much nutrition compared to um, maybe a diet that's higher in protein, however you get that via plants or meats um, and less of that uh, processed foods, then you're basically maybe kind of potentiating or increasing this lean um, body, lean mass loss, because you don't get, you're not having the time to kind of retrain your body. You don't have the time to do the weightlifting that is required to keep those things, um, to keep your muscles strong and prevent them from just disappearing too. Is it, is it possible that the increased satiety might be causing people to consume less calories also, less calories from protein, and that might be a reason why we're seeing that initial lean uh, lean mass loss? Yeah, I would say that's definitely probably the major mechanism of how they cause weight loss um, is that people are just eating less. And again, if you eat a lot less, but the stuff that you're eating is still not good, then you might not be necessarily feeling the effects of your poor diet in terms of being hungry all the time because again we always talk about this like the cycle where your body learns to crave certain combinations of delicious and processed foods um, that can also be associated with glucose spikes and then drops and then while well, you're right back where you started when your body is now um, creating those uh, another you know bolus of food another amount of food 
Um, and so people tend to have, you know, high amounts of snacking and then they don't sleep well and then it becomes this kind of cycle. So if you're eating that same stuff, but you just feel more full because you're on these medications, then you can understand why you lose a lot of weight. And then as soon as you stop while you're eating that same stuff, you just start eating it at twice as much again. Well, regardless, I think that suggestion that people who take these drugs consider um, resistance training, strength training is, is a great suggestion to at least maintain that, that lean muscle as, uh, as they lose fat or adipose tissue. Yeah. And you can, you know, you can build that or you can um, get that fat or a muscle loss close to almost zero or 5% if you're on, even when you're on these medications. Um, I've heard some people say if you're doing these DEXA scans over time, as long as you are really, really focusing on the associated health um, behaviors that we know are good, kind of no matter what your weight is, which includes exercise or physical activity and especially resistance training. And that leads me to my next question, which is for our, our members, for Cygnos members that are um, considering taking these drugs. Are there, first, is there anything they're going to see in their data when they tar start to take uh, one of the, these GLP-1s? Are they going to see their glucose drop a lot? Are they going to see it more stable? What, what would you expect? Yeah, I, I would definitely think both of those things. Um, again, especially... If you know, a lot of our members are not on other associated hypoglycemic medications or medicines to, to control your sugars. Um, and so you'll probably see a pretty immediate uh, response for your glucose levels, I'd say. I mean, as we know, these already just by themselves, without any necessarily without weight loss, you know, improve overall glucose metrics. Um, but I think that, you know, healthy habits will always be a part of a long-term wellness plan. And one of the things that Cygnos does is help you find those healthier habits for you. Um, so I'll say, you know, GLP ones are not an overnight cure for the metabolic disease that's all around us. They take time to work. Um, and so I think that, uh, using them in combination intuitively makes sense to me. It's not something we've necessarily studied specifically. <laughs> um, so I can't say for certain, but you know, any reasonable uh, health plan includes both medications and, you know, healthy behaviors, diet and physical activity. And so, um, I mean, people kind of set up this false dichotomy where it's like doctors only care about giving medications. Um, other people only care about, you know, diet and exercise. And that's the true root cause. Um, doctors just want to prescribe medications because they get paid. And I think that's really, um, I, mean, I don't want to say offensive to doctors, but it's really not what, how doctors think, um, almost entirely. And so uh, we want to jumpstart any long-term behaviors, right? So medications can help control things while we have time to address the behaviors or the genetics or whatever the environment that are causing these um, things to happen and it's not cheating and it's not um it's not because we get lots of money for prescribing medications which we really don't um it's because you know we are certainly trained how to prescribe medications but uh but those because the for the most part they do work really well on preventing some of the bad outcomes that we don't that we want to avoid yeah, really well said and i I was thinking as I was looking through all this research that uh, for our Cygnus members that are considering one of these drugs, if they are not planning on taking it long term, that um, using Cygnus can be a great aftercare. Because as you mentioned earlier, once you go off these drugs, at least the short term studies we've, we've looked at so far, the people that go off do gain some of that weight back. Um, but adding in some lifestyle changes, um, some exercise habits, good eating habits might be the combination that you need to at least help uh, keep some of this weight from coming back, correct? Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, that is the, with any intervention, the way to maintain healthy weight is what we talked about is to eat high protein, satisfying, satiating 
uh, meals, avoid processed foods, incorporate as much physical activity as you can, basically, <laughs> um, and, until it, and, and until it's uh, to an extreme degree. And then um, to just keep monitoring, right? You, you, if you start to, if you start to go in a direction that you don't want to be going in, you have to kind of reframe where you are and, and look around and say, what am I doing in this last however long that's got me where I am? And so just some sort of monitoring is, is crucial. Doc, thanks so much for being on the show, shedding some light on this topic that I know has been covered everywhere, but I think there's a, still a lot of confusion um, as I've, I've read these articles. I, I've even seen, and you mentioned this, I think, in one of our discussion channels, there were some mainstream media publications that were saying you'd use this one drug and take another, and they're the exact same drug, just under different brand names. Yeah, so I'll actually maybe say that out loud. So, so semaglutide is the generic. Uh, yes. It is branded for type 2 diabetes as Ozempic, and it is branded uh, for obesity as Wagovi. Um, so it's, but it's the same medication. Therefore, and I just different doses. Therefore, people are using the Ozempic version for obesity, which it is indicated for. Um, just under a different brand name. So um, just wanted to make sure that was clear. Um, and there is definitely shortages now, which I hope will be relieved. Cost is a huge issue. We didn't necessarily talk about that, but um, you know, these all can cost upwards of $1,000 a month, depending on insurance coverage and uh, coupons from the company. So you know, maybe that will change in 10 years or 15 years or whatever. But in the short term, that's obviously prohibitive for a lot of people. Um, so, yeah. So just to, just to co conclude, wrap up, some of the considerations, if you are thinking of, of taking one of these GLP-1s, talking to your doctor about it, is there are social concerns because you might be taking these drugs off the, uh, or get, or there are people that need them for type 2 diabetes or that um, need it for obesity and it's medically indicated for them to lose weight. So, that's one consideration. There's also the fact that um, you really should be taking it long term if you want to maintain the weight loss. If not, then you really have to have um, lifestyle changes, lifestyle modifications, both diet and exercise to maintain that weight loss. There's that cost consideration that you just mentioned right now, about $1,000 a month, but that's depending on insurance coverage. So all these things really should go into your consideration. And of course, this... Uh, the show and Dr. Dixon's appearance here on the show is not intended for uh, medical advice. There's no patient to client relationship, patient relationship established. So talk to your doctor about this if you're considering one of these these drugs. So Doc, thanks so much for uh, for just giving us the lowdown on these these drugs. I think uh, this is going to clear up a lot of confusion that people have. Or triple it, who knows? But yes, <laughs> hopefully not. If I, if it triples it, I will hear about it, and we will do a follow up episode. I did my best. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a tricky spot. Um, but again, I think some some nuance around all this is always important. Uh, people have very strong opinions on both sides about this, and I think it will even out over time. Um, and that's where I am now. So hopefully, this is helpful. Thanks, Doc. And we look forward to having you on again to clear up confusion on something else. Yeah, or dribble it. <laughs> or dribble it. All right. Thanks, Doc. Don't forget to subscribe, like this video, and tap the bell icon to be the first to get more videos like this one and stay connected with the signals.